The Wealth Standard would like to congratulate Patrick Donahoe for being named as one of the nation's top 100 financial advisors by Investopedia. If you would like a free consultation with Patrick's team of wealth strategists, you can set up your appointment today at thewealthstandard.com forward slash meeting. Grow and protect your wealth outside of Wall Street. Go to thewealthstandard.com forward slash meeting and schedule your appointment today. Thanks for listening to The Wealth Standard. Welcome to the 2018 seasons of the Wealth Standard Podcast, celebrating life, liberty, and property. You are listening to Liberty Season 2. So, Tom, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have you. Thanks for taking the time. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Tom, what I thought, what I thought we'd do is, is first just have you give a, a brief kind of Reader's Digest background um, so that the listeners know a little bit about, uh, about you. And then we can dive into one of the books uh, you've written recently uh, and then start to, to talk about, you know, what, uh, what impact you, you see uh, that book is, is, uh, is making. Yeah, you bet. So, I mean, I have a, a hodgepodge of uh, experiences, but what unites them all is sort of a commitment to entrepreneurs and small business people. So out of college, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa and I helped women start small businesses. And uh, after some time, I ended up running Great Harvest Bread Company, which is a franchise. So a community of 170 at that time, different small business owners. Um, we sold that company and I went to work for a private equity firm, sourcing investments in small businesses on behalf of uh, folks that are trying to earn money uh, as, as investors. And, and then I bought uh, a company that serves consulting firms and, uh, and wrote a book about that company called How Clients Buy because I'm really interested in how entrepreneurship is uh, increasingly less around earning a return on uh, assets um, as opposed to earning a return on, on expertise. That mm -hmm. seems like that's where the world's going. Um, and uh, anyway, that's my background in a nutshell. So, and, and it's interesting because I, I would say the, the landscape of, of just work in general, business in general, is, is changing at, uh, at, a, at a rapid pace. Yeah. And some, some industries are acclimating, uh, others, others aren't. Uh, and I would say, you know, employees to an extent um, are, are acclimating, uh, others, others aren't. So as your, you know, your current venture and your, in your current book, what's the, what's the mission or main theme of that book? You know, it's empowering people that have an expertise that can help a cohort of people. You know, I feel like there are vexing problems that, uh, that, that uh, face all of us across the globe. And yet there are pockets of great expertise, you know, in our head and our friend's head. And, but it's an inefficient market, like connecting expertise with need mm -hmm. is inefficient. And I'm really, I'm really focused it on, on, on these days because I feel like that's where the entrepreneurial like uh, opportunity is. I spent quite a lot of time at Great Harvest in the kind of B2C space, but that, that B2B space is really interesting and growing at 11% this last year, which is, you know, three times the GDP growth. So how do you, and maybe this is a, you know, this is addressed in, in the book and that would, that would be great if you highlighted that. But w what is it that, what is it that gets a person to, you know, maybe come to the conclusion that they're an expert in something that they have an expertise because, you know, my, in my, in my experience, you know, oftentimes there are, you know, highly, pay, uh, highly paid employees, uh, those that develop expertise, but they're so in the weeds that, you know, they don't necessarily uh, identify it. So how, do, how does someone come to a point where they, they do have an expertise or understand that? Uh, and then maybe if they don't, how do they develop one? Yeah, the quickest way to become a consultant is to get laid off. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Terrible. But uh, no, I mean, I think what you do is you end up working in a company and you make a difference. You mm -hmm. build a warehouse of the future uh, that uh, serves, uh, you know, a food distribution company or you implement a cybersecurity solution across a multi-unit uh, food enterprise. And you're proud of that work. And you think, I'd like to do that work on behalf of other like clients, but you're mm -hmm. captive inside the organization. And so you think, well, I'm going to break away and use this one case study 
of real value that you've created in the world. And I'm going to begin to ask other people that have similar problems, whether or not that value would be of use to them. That's mm -hmm. the way most people get into consulting. And I would, you know, for, and this goes to experience and it's interesting because one of our, one of our business consultants is here today and she worked at a, at a really large, uh, uh, company and ran their entire development technology and development department, uh, you know, hundreds of employees. And, and she, you know, got to this point where she was unhappy. She didn't get fired, but she was just un unhappy, disgruntled and, and looking at all the time and effort she was putting into it right? The, the, the anxiety of it all, even though there was remuneration financially, the anxiety of it all really wasn't, really wasn't worth it. So where, where do you, where is most of these people, are most people work, these people work, working like in a company, they're entrepreneurs and they develop a skill set there and then look to transition out? Or is this more of those that are already out trying to continue to develop their skill set? You know, I think most of us get out of college and we end up working for an organization and, uh, and we develop some expertise, we get some reps on a problem. And, uh, and then we start to think, you know what, I could sell this to the wider world. And there are just flat limits to the amount of uh, money you can make inside an organization, because ultimately organizations, companies are built on a labor arbitrage between what they can buy your labor for and what they can sell it for. Uh -huh. And so they're going to cap the value that you can create. Um, in the pre interview before we started the interview here, you mentioned a study that said increasingly people are finding the middle classes is, is sort of an unapproachable or unattainable goal um, in the context of being a wage employee in a large organization. And there's only one solution to that. And it's a solution that brings the joy of uh, more perfect freedom and higher remuneration. And that is to sort of go out on your own and, uh, and most, you know, the, the smartest way to start a business is to, to do what you're already doing in a slightly different context. And so that, that mm -hmm. to me is the wellspring out of which most consultants, most people that sell their expertise, whether it's law or uh, cybersecurity or accounting, break out. They say, you know, I'm going to, uh, maybe I'll even keep my current company as a client. It'll be my anchor client but I'm just going to open up the possibility that I could start to bring on other clients and I'm going to teach people how to deliver the expertise that I deliver and get leverage on their, their time. And that's what makes me an equity holder. Hmm. And that's what makes me uh, able to get sort of uh, leverage on my time in the marketplace. How, how would, how would someone find out if there's an actual market for what they do? Now, obviously they're employed, which means there's a market, you know, internally with the company. How right. does one discover other opportunities that are not necessarily employee based okay, out in the marketplace? Yeah. So over, uh, over a meal, like you go to the industry conference and, uh, you go to two or three of the companies that you know that are adjacent to the company you work for and you say, Hey, I'd like to just ask your advice. Most everyone will give you advice, right? It's free, free, especially if you buy them a meal and uh, you sit down with them and go, I'm sort of, you know, crazy thought. I, I've just made a huge difference, created a lot of value inside this company on one particular uh, project. And I think it's got legs in the marketplace. What, could you imagine a company like yours ever purchasing services like this? Explain to me how that works and hmm. explain who the incumbents are and how you think about that purchase. And so you do market research one by one, five companies, and you might be surprised. You might land your first external client hmm. uh, right there on the spot. Well, I think it's, I think it's interesting that, you know, you, you, you do have a, an increase in the number of, of consultants that are, that are out there. And, and, and I think it's just, again, it's going back to the landscape of business and how, you know, business is leaning toward those types of relationships as opposed to, you know, committing to uh, employee-based relationships. Uh, but instead of going down that, that, uh, that rabbit trail, what are, you know, there's this, uh, idea called boomer reinvention. And I interviewed a guy, you know, last year, and it was basically the fact that, you know, with life expectancies going up with uh, lackluster interest rates and returns that, you know, it's almost becoming a, a necessity for individuals that are, are in their fifties and, and early sixties, instead of, you know, fully retiring are having to, you know, partially retire 
and, and be, be a consultant, which I believe personally is, is healthy. I think it keeps a, a person vibrant, keeps their mind right. going, which is a big part of, of, you know, how their, their physical well being is, but maybe, maybe talk, talk to that, the, you know, the, the exiting of these individuals and, and maybe the uh, upper, upper age uh, range, as far as a company is concerned and, and what you're seeing, like what's, what are some examples you're seeing of success? Yeah, I mean, you see that over and over again, because I mean, the downside to spinning out on your own, right, whether you're an attorney or whether you're a cybersecurity expert or an HR or training expert, is that uh, that kind of income can be lumpy. Um, you can have uh, high revenues for six months and nothing for three months. And so uh, uh, if you're graduating from college and you've got student loans and you're raising a family and you got a big mortgage, it's hard to take that kind of risk. Um, people mitigate it by having their spouses, uh, maybe in a, in a steadier job that's got health insurance. But, you know, mm. empty nesters are an ideal group of people to begin to take a lifetime of expertise and begin to sort of uh, build a bridge to the people that they could help outside of the company that they, uh, they, 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 they served over the course of a lifetime. I'm in two weeks, my son is sec my second child, my son is going to graduate from high school. And, uh, you know, when he graduates from college, that's going to be an expensive endeavor. I, I'm going to feel a certain freedom, like the mortgage is paid down. I've, I've sort of I've, I've, I've fulfilled the obligation I feel to my kids around education. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that uh, maybe I would take on some gigs, and this is all about being an active participant in a gig economy, um, uh, sounds pretty good to me. The money can be exceptionally good, right? Because you can charge way more as an outside expert than you can as a wage employee. No, that's a great point. So are there, are there any examples that maybe come to mind that you've experienced or maybe talked about in, uh, in your book uh, of, this, of this world? Yeah, so I'm talking, uh, I'm in Dallas right now on a sales trip and I'm about to fly to New York this afternoon and tomorrow in Manhattan, I'm gonna meet a fellow who's 67 years old and he's run two health and uh, two life insurance companies in his past as CEO, and uh, they, they both those companies had uh, mac or sort of uh, retirement ages required retirement ages, and so uh, he has become a consultant in the turnaround industry hmm. and very successful at it. And uh, this is not going to come to you as a surprise. He uh, he's really good at turning around uh, life insurance companies. <laughs> you know, I mean, the idea that your expertise is going to come from someplace other than your education and experience is, is probably a, a little far-fetched, but he spent a lifetime in the bowels of, of two large organizations, and he knows what drives success, and he knows where the failure is, and he's killing it, um, and he's doing it half-time, um, but there's a very uh, small group of people in the world that can benefit from his expertise and they all know him. And that's, you know, right now with insurance companies, low, low interest rates, the regulatory environment, increased life expectancies. I mean, it's, uh, there's, I mean, I, I think in, in New York, MetLife went, uh, you know, is not doing insurance anymore, even though they were kind of the iconic, iconic one back in the day. Uh, so it's, it's interesting with the, but I, I would say that that's, that's just an, uh, an example. There are industries, all industries, Right, I I would say are experiencing you know this this necessity of changing right whether it's adoption of technology whether it's adoption of you know certain uh, cultural practices like with their you know their company culture and how they treat employees and what you know millennials want as far as benefits versus the X generation I mean it's a very very interesting but I think you know you're hitting on a a good point where when when somebody identifies that they have a skill set. Uh, and that skill set is valuable in in the marketplace. I mean, it's it's one of those you know it's one of those things where you can write your own write your own ticket. And like I said, you know, this guy's sixty seven. I mean, it, yeah. I, I'm assuming at this point that you know he's he's not doing it because he needs money. He's doing it because you know there's this sense of fulfillment by taking something that you became an expert in and providing value and service to to others. Exactly. You know, I want to just comment a little bit about the role of technology and how that's changing this particular world. Um, so, you know, technology enables us uh, to do things uh, smarter and to automate what we do. And it also expands our sort of geographic reach. So it used to be the experts all existed within a community. They 
they went to church, they went to the country club, they met people um, that grow, grew to sort of know and trust them. And, uh, and they, uh, if someone could benefit from their expertise, they said, hey, Tom, I'm wondering if you could come help me with a project. But technology allows us to serve markets across the globe. Um, and that's a cool thing. It's also like a really scary thing. Like there are a lot of people in the world mm -hmm. and it, look out at that world. It's like hard to imagine like, well, where do I, where do I start here? Um, technology also allows us to broadcast our message to a huge number of people. Um, and one of the things that we write about in the book is that, that in the world of services, that can be a trap. The notion that you can spray if you will, your point of view out to the world is a B2C perspective, mm -hmm. really a B2B perspective. And so um, I think one of the key pieces of advice that we give consultants and would-be consultants is uh, figure out the list of 200 people in the world that can most benefit from your expertise. And if you got if you got 25% of that list to be clients, it would change your world. And then focus like a laser beam on connecting those 200 people together and underwriting a conversation between them about what's working and what's not. Because the other thing about technology is that it's uh, disrupting every industry. So what people have, have done in the past that works doesn't work anymore and they want to talk to each other. Yeah, I, I, like the, I like the idea of, you know, just a narrow focus because if it's a wide focus, it's not focused. And oftentimes, you know, what I like, what I, what I like to do is, is kind of evaluate a different perspective on a financial statement. Uh, and we, I call it the human capital statement, which is essentially, you know, the establishment of your skill set, your talents, your abilities, your expertise. Uh, but also another asset aside from those is, is your core and key relationships. And I think if you build those meaningful relationships Okay, that, that right there, I mean, even though you have widespread communication, technology is enabling that, okay, human beings still, you know, uh, don't necessarily connect off of the superficial relationships, right, which is like the scattered message. You know, they right. still connect off, off the very focused, meaningful uh, relationships, even though, even though they might be virtual, okay. But I think those key relationships, you never know what can come from them. So, you know, whether it's targeting uh, or as you said earlier, it's going to uh, meetups or conferences or industry events and establishing relationships that way and staying in contact with them. I mean, that, that's a huge asset on that, you know, that, that perspective on a, on a financial statement or, you know, building what we call your human capital assets. Uh, but what do you, maybe as we kind of tra transition uh, out, you know, what, what are, you know, what are some maybe final thoughts as we've been, we've been talking about, you know, things that uh, either younger, younger employees uh, can, can do to establish an expertise, what old, what seasoned tenured employees can do to, uh, you know, essentially recognize their expertise and then pursue, you know, a consulting, consulting role with, which obviously gives more freedom, more flexibility, maybe even more money. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, we've talked a little bit about most people know that they, they've done, they've gotten some reps on a certain kind of project and they're like, I could do this um, elsewhere. I think the thing that we were talking a little bit about technology, one of the downsides of technology is it's not a very efficient way of communicating trust. And it turns out that you have to trust somebody in order to hire them to be an expert. Mm -hmm. So economists have a very specific uh, term for this. They say that expert services sales are credence goods. So credence, that's the Latin word for like credibility, believable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that just means simply that when you buy a laptop, you buy it on features and attributes. You buy it on price and color and processor speed and screen size and pixels, the whole nine yards. But when you're buying services, you buy it on relationships and reputation and referral. And that's because they're credence goods. So what are credence goods? Credence goods are services where the person that is helping you solve the problem is also helping you diagnose the problem. Hmm. And in those situations, you need more trust. So imagine, for example, I have a Ford pickup. I take it down to the, the shop. It's making a noise. And the mechanic goes, yeah, that ping, you're going to need a valve job. So that's like a $1,500 diagnosis. But she could also say to me, 
you know, it's an old truck. Uh, you might try using high test because uh, that'll probably take the ping away. She wouldn't make any money on that at all. I have to trust her that she has my best interests at heart. Not that she says she's smart, but that she has my best interests at heart in order to allow her to proceed. Same thing in medicine. Uh, you go into the doctor and uh, they start digging around in your, your, near your pancreas or something like that. You have to trust they have your best interests at heart and they don't go, oh, look, it looks like you're going to need like a huge operation or, you know, as opposed to them saying, uh, you know, next time maybe what you should do is just take, take some Tums after you, after you eat pizza. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just want to sort of highlight that notion of trust because it's the one thing that is not well amplified across technology. Mm -hmm. And it's another reason why you need to narrow cast because those 200 people they can change your life. You need to build trust with them. And that happens over time. It happens working side by side. Mm -hmm. It happens in individual conversations. But it's, uh, it is most of all a function of uh, demonstrating your expertise, demonstrating you have their best interest at heart, and doing that over time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that, if that makes sense. But no, it totally does. And I, I look at, you know, I look at technology's role right? As, as you said, the amplification of that relationship, I would say the relationship itself is, is based on a lot more intimate type of experience, right? And it, and it comes throughout, it comes by, it comes by, you know, maintaining a reputation. It comes by, uh, you know, doing right by others. It comes by, you know, maintaining contact and having, you know, meetups and so forth. I think the technology is just there to supplement, is to supplement that, but not replace it because you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, and so I would, so I would say, you know, as far as learning more about this idea of, you know, establishing your career, establishing your skill set, establishing your expertise and, you know, finding opportunities based on that. I mean, you, you sound like you've, you know, really had experience with uh, a number of people in order to, to help kind of provide that, uh, that catalyst to, uh, you know, connecting the dots between what a person, uh, what their assets are, their their personal assets, uh, and the opportunities that are available in the in the marketplace. So, yeah. one of the best things that are talking. What, sorry, you're going to say a comment. No, I just I want to second your thought that that your relationships, the people that you have worked with before, that know that a you can deliver on what you say you can deliver on, yep. and b that trust that you have their best interests at heart. Um, that's money in the bank. So me saying it's money in the bank is another way of what you were saying, which is it's an asset on your personal balance sheet. And so stay in touch with those people, mm -hmm. continue to add value to them because it is, that is the foundation upon which a services business is built. Yep. Um, the most successful consultants in the world just have a, an accumulation of people that they've worked with, but it yep. rarely exceeds 500. We, we uh, interviewed the CEO of McKinsey and uh, Dominic Barton. And he said, look, I've got 500 people I try and stay in touch with. That's the 500 human relationships that are on his balance sheet. Um, he never thinks about the entire globe as his oyster. He thinks about serving a specific cohort of people that can benefit from his experience and his education. Yep. And you know what's interesting? This is just kind of a, a side note based on what you just what you just said. You know, oftentimes, because when you said money in the bank, it's not literally money in the bank because sometimes you actually have to pay money, right? You you might have to eat, you know, a mistake. You might have to, uh, you know, do a, a favor. You might have to, you know, go above and beyond, right, to to establish that credibility. So the money in the bank is it is it literal? It's kind of like you know an option on future money. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it's like you own a big piece of land which has development potential yep. and yet you need to put a fence around it and yeah, you need to keep it mowed and yeah, it's got value, but it's, uh, it's not liquid like you say. Yeah. You know, people say, uh, what's the single best thing I can do to build trust with people that I don't know? And uh, I say it's to say no, not to say yes. And people are like, what are you talking about? Isn't it, isn't it all about just serving the customer and saying yes? The single biggest thing you can do is when someone says, hey, Tom, do you, um, could you help me with my HR strategy? And I go, no, I can't. I actually don't know a lot about that. But I know a guy. 
named uh-huh. Pat Cassano, who's really smart at that. And I would warmly recommend you let me make a recommendation. So that suggests, that communicates very clearly, mm-hmm. I'm not optimizing on my own uh, uh, sort of uh, compensation in the short run, mm-hmm. but rather trying to help you solve a problem. Yep. That builds trust. What's interesting, this is, so a part of that, you know, a balance sheet is assets and liabilities, right? So you have your assets, which is your expertise, but you have liability, which is not your expertise, but relationships associated with those liabilities is an asset. So the idea, you know, the idea is when you connect, you know, someone to someone, cause I love, I love doing this. I learned this early, early on. When you make those connections, there's, there's this like sense of reciprocity that actually, you know, Correct. builds you as, uh, you know, builds your expertise as well. And it gives you a chance to do a little advertisement. Like, you know what? Uh, HR is not my thing. Cybersecurity is my thing. Mm-hmm. So please, when you hear about opportunities around cybersecurity, remember me. Yep. I can't help you with here. No. Let me give you somebody who can help you. Yep. And that, yep. again, it's one of those, you don't, never know when someone's going to need cybersecurity, whatever the expertise is. And that's why, you know, using technology as kind of the supplement where you can stay in touch with people reminding them that this is your expertise, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't necessarily replace, you know, that human touch, you know, intimate, uh, you know, intimate element. So it's interesting. What, what you say is really true, which is no one needs a consultant until they do. So they do. And when they do, there's like, who's top of mind. Uh-huh. So I'm like one. Of, so this, the sales model with products or like software is sort of a churn and burn model, which is I got a list. I'll work the list. I'm going to convert you Patrick from a yes or to a no, but I'm going to, I'm going to move through the list. A services or consulting model says I have a group of people I want to serve over my lifetime Mm -hmm. and I need to stay proximate to them, adding value to them because no one needs a cybersecurity expert until they get hacked and their boss says, you need to fix it. (laughs) Cybersecurity. No, I know Patrick, he's a really smart guy on this. And that could be seven years after you met with them and, countless amounts of value that you've added to them for free yep. in the short run. This is awesome, Tom. I mean, th- this is something I think about all the time and try to, and try to talk about often because I, I see it in so many different capacities, right? And, and people may not acknowledge the, you know, how we've explained it today, uh, but people are experiencing this all the time. And I would say, hopefully those that are listening can, you know, really start to organize these types of experiences, their relationships, what they do, how they nurture, how they foster uh, more. Uh, but it's been an awesome conversation. How can people learn more about uh, your, your books? I mean, we're going to post everything on the show notes and, and uh, in our social media and email. Uh, but for those that are listening, how can people follow you, uh, buy your books, and, uh, and you know, learn, more, learn more about your expertise? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is the book is called How Clients Buy. And uh, we have a website, howclientsbuy.net. You can get the book on Amazon. That link to the website is on Amazon. Um, The company that I run, which helps larger consultants actually drive the business development process, is a company called Profitable Ideas Exchange. And it it can be found at uh, profitableideas.com. Um, and you can sort of see the service offering that we have for, for larger consulting firms. Perfect. Tom, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you so much for the thoughtful conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us as the Wealth Standard Podcast spends all of 2018 celebrating life, liberty, and property. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll see you on the next one. The Wealth Standard would like to congratulate Patrick Donahoe for being named as one of the nation's top 100 financial advisors by Investopedia. If you would like a free consultation with Patrick's team of wealth strategists, you can set up your appointment today at thewealthstandard.com forward slash meeting. Patrick and his hand-picked team have helped thousands of Americans just like you grow and protect their wealth outside of Wall Street. Go to thewealthstandard.com forward slash meeting and schedule your appointment today.